join me in welcoming a historian, lecturer, and professor, Decida Coughlin Light, once again. Thank you so much. Genealogy 101. Thank you. Genealogy 101, and let's hope we keep the, keep the PowerPoint this time. So this picture I'll just talk about briefly is something that I found in my parents' home. And fortunately, I found it before my parents left this world. And it is so wonderful because this is it's so much family history here and so much community history and so much history of the Baptist Church and education in Virginia. This was the baseball team at the Rappahannock Industrial Academy, which was one of the Negro academies that black folks put together early in the 20th century when there were no public high schools in rural areas for black people. <coughs> and so, both of my parents went to the Rappahannock Industrial Academy. That's my father there in the center of the picture, middle row. And it says, uh, team, the 1930 team, the team that could not be defeated. And interestingly enough, I don't know whether I can get the cursor going, but the person <coughs> on the back row, second from the left, is J. Murray Brooks, who is the brother of Lyman Beecher Brooks, who was the president of North State. And the Brooks brothers came to the Middle Peninsula, taught there, and then went out to the world. But anyway, this is a picture I found. I've got other relatives on there. Unfortunately, we found it too late to identify all the people on it, but it's one of those finds that I treasure. And actually, I'm the historian for the Rappahannock Industrial Academy, and it's the oldest picture that we have. Black folks can't do genealogy. I mean, there's this notion that there's nothing out there for us. They didn't keep records on us. They destroyed all the records, whatever. Well, you know, we have issues, but there's plenty out there. I've been doing this, as you've heard, for 40 years, and I find something new every week. Every time I sit down at the computer or go to the archive, I find something. So, uh, Library of Virginia, as I've mentioned, just, we're so fortunate. I want to move this quickly. But I was so um, well, accustomed to doing research in Virginia. Had no idea how far we were ahead of many of the other states until I went to Annapolis. And oh, did I start to appreciate our archive here in Virginia. So it's wonderful. There are census records vital records which we birth, death, marriage, wills, estate inventories, plantation records, freedom papers, Freedmen's Bureau records, and just on and on and on. So there's a lot out of print. Um, one of the things you want to do is figure out as you're embarking upon this, or even if you've been doing it a while, make sure that you know how you want to organize it. Because very, very quickly, one could be under a C of papers and a whole sea of electronic documents. So you want to find the system that works for you. Um, whether you're going to maintain files electronically in hard copy <coughs> or both, and I suggest both. You know, I have um, files that were created with the first genealogy software that I got, which was probably in the late 80s. I can't access those with my present operating system. And so, thank goodness, I printed out some of that material. So, you know, there's nothing like paper. And of course, make sure you keep the paper appropriately. And that's another topic that is acid free and it's the right kind of paper and all that. Um, and so, I suggest that you consider software, software on your computer. I mean, it's fine that you maintain your records in the cloud, but you want to have them, your records on your own device. And there are all kinds of organizational things that will help you uh, on Family Search and the different websites. So start with what you know. If you say, well, I don't know anything. You'd be surprised how much you do know. Record all that you know, starting with yourself. You know your parents, and 
many of us know parents, and then you may have an issue of trying to figure out who a parent is, but right now that's what you know. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts and uncles, and as far back as you can go, and include all the names, first, middle, last, and if you're not sure, right now, all you say, you know, my aunt must have been, you know, at least 82 years old when she died, so write down that approximation as you start. Um, and then start to jot down what you know about the family members, not just the hard, cold dates and facts, but some of those things that fill in the skeleton of their lives. So you want to go on a treasure hunt and look at what's in your house for starters. So actually at home, you probably have some birth, marriage, and death records. You might probably have some newspaper clippings, obituaries, wedding programs, anniversary announcements, funeral programs, family letters. Um, you may have your baptism certificate in your home. And so you want to really look at, of course, the ever-present family Bible. Um, if you have one of those, then you are very, very lucky. Um, and it goes on and on. Letters. Um, I actually found a bag of about a hundred letters that my father wrote to my mother from the South Pacific during World War II. And she just kept them. And so um, yearbooks, all kinds of heirlooms and collectibles, any kind of document that you might find, um, just like the our uncle's receipts that I told you about that I found to the Bank of Middlesex, which led me to then research his life and to see what I could learn about him. And then when you finish that, go to your mother's home, your father's home, and your uncle and your aunt and your cousin and so on. And then you want to talk to your relatives. I call them living libraries. They may be able to give you information that would shave so much time off. An example, I found a six-year-old living in my great-grandparents' home in King and Queen County in the 1900 census. And different name, I had no idea who she was. And of course, you know, census records are supposed to give the relationship of the person in the home to the head of the household, which, you know, that at that point in time is considered the man. And so it said niece. And I just couldn't figure that out. Anyway, so I asked my uncle, uncle who's on that baseball picture and his son, he, when he died 19 years ago, but I was able to ask him. And he said, oh, and it said Virgie G. Davis was the six-year-old's name. So he said, oh, that was Gretchen. That was grandma's sister's child. And grandma kept her after her sister went away. And then she said, but then Gretchen started to get so fresh that grandma sent her back to where she came from. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I was, where did she come from? <laughs> he had no clue. Now understand, he's born in 1909, and he's reporting what's been told to him. And later on, I found a lot of truth in what he was saying. But anyway, you want to be able to talk. <clears throat> Record them if you can. Sometimes when you make it that formal, people get a little leery and back up a little bit, but when you can record them, do. Um, and not just your elders, but I find that even somebody who's just a smidge older than I am knows something that I don't know in my family. The other piece is that sometimes one person remembers something that somebody else didn't. And another thing is if you are raised by grandparents or a generation, a couple of generations away, then you would have a very different experience and body of knowledge than if you were raised by the younger people. So you can want to interview all those folks. Um, and, and don't delay. You know, your library is not going to be alive forever. You see a picture of us, this was an interview we were doing in our church. And what we found out is that sometimes putting two people together who have a similar experience, you get the synergistic effect. One plus one is more than two. So the one helps the other one remember. So, of course, you have to kind of judge it and see whether that is really going to work or whether it's going to be a deterrent. A lot of plenty of time, you may have to visit them more than once, and then you may find that if you make it formal, 
they kind of clam, clam up. But if you just were sitting at the table talking, um, then you may get something that you would not have gotten. And I think it's fitting this way. I'm not ready for the new slide. Okay. So the Get Together information, this is just a graphic to show you. You can certainly start online. And being able to do research online saves a whole lot of time. But it's like the tip of the iceberg. It really is. Now, when I started doing this, the only way you could get census records around here was you go to Live in Virginia. And they had Virginia and a couple of neighboring states. So if you wanted census records further, you had to go to Live Congress. And so the fact that you can do that PJs at 3 o'clock in the morning, or come into the library if that's the case, then it certainly is important, but not, um, not that you can rely upon it completely. So, you want to use all the tools you can. Ancestry.com, family search, Ancestry is a subscription based um, platform. Family search is always free. I use them both all the time. Um, ancestry, to me, is worth its way to go. Although they start to get more expensive, I hear people complaining about the price, but it really is important. Um, does this library have a subscription to Ancestry? Yes. Okay. And so the library edition, you can come into the library, and library edition is a little bit different from what you have at home, but you uh, come in email yourself documents, it will save to your flash drive and so forth. Your state and local archives, your county and city courthouses, university special collections, if you're fortunate, Virginia State, Virginia Union, William and Mary, all kinds of um, big historical societies. Records might be anywhere. Um, some of the things you want to kind of be aware of, you know, genealogy doesn't exist in a vacuum got to look at what else is going on. You need to know the area that you're researching. I am at occasion started researching Cecil County, Maryland, which is northern Maryland. It's 1295 before you get to um, Delaware. And my husband's father's family is from. Well, I didn't know anything about Cecil County, so I had to learn. And I found that his family, the Blakens, were free Negroes in the middle of the 19th Google Maps 
may know some know, and Google Maps may not. So you want to have to do some work to figure out. And then you may find some of those old place names in records, like marriage records, or in, um, in census records as well. So one of the basic things, and this is still talking about what anybody would do, start with the 1950 census. Of course, you know the census is taken every 10 years, federal census, and by law, it um, cannot be public until you know, 72 years after it was taken. So just this year, this was a census year. So April 1st, the 1950 <coughs> census came out. And some of us who are about my age bracket were excited because it was the first time that we could see ourselves in a public census. And so we want to look at the census and work back. And you look at the Bible records, military, be surprised what type of military records, school records, church records, on and on and on. So, 1950 census. It's interesting that um, this was the first fully electronic census launch. Then in 1940 it was launched, it was partial. 1930, um, you know, folks used to camp out at the National Archives at midnight and the archives would open so folks could be in there at 1201. And when the 1940 launch, the system crashed. They were not ready for all the genealogists who were going to just really overpower the system. But this time it worked, and I actually didn't remember it until 1220. I forgot, oh, it's April 1. So I go on, and guess what? I find myself twice in the 1950 census. <laughs> At the top, you'll see me, I'm two years old, mm -hmm. in Middlesex County with my parents, and that's where I'm supposed to be. It says the slide that my name is spelled correctly, says, Head of household, Randolph White, White Gladys, daughter, beside it too. So there I am, and so that was great. But then I kept looking, looking for, I wasn't looking for myself anymore, but looked, and there are my grandparents in the next county, and there's a two year old granddaughter, D E S I A D A, or something, something like that, but there I am again. And so what it means is somebody didn't follow the instructions. Mm -hmm because I really should have been listed where I live and not where I was being babysat with the grandparents. But anyway, um, so you want to just work your family back. Who was alive in 1950? So even if you weren't born until 1963, then your parents were probably alive, your grandparents. So you start in 1950, 40, 30, <coughs> working them on back. Um, and of course, the, the census record started in 1790. Um, in terms of black folk, you're going to find everybody listed first in the 1870 census. So those people who were enslaved are not going to be listed by name before 1870. And then there are other um, enumerations. There's an agriculture census, a mortality <laughs> schedule that says who died that year. That's the only way I found when one of my great grandparents died because the death record just doesn't exist. But I found her in the mortality schedule. And the cause of death is hemorrhage of the womb, so she died in childbirth. And that's the only way I found her. And then the veterans um, census. You know that the 1890 census was largely destroyed in a fire. And so we look at things that we can do to substitute for that 1890 census. One of the things, if you have a veteran, then the veteran census um, for 1890 is a point of substitutes. So, all kinds of records, I'll kind of run through these quickly. This is a birth record from my father. And you kind of have to learn when your jurisdiction kept records. Because Virginia, just ahead of the game, started keeping vital records in 1853. But guess what? They stopped in 1896. So you get this deep vacuum from 1896 until 1912 that is just vast nothingness. And so you may see someone in there alive in 1900, their spouse is widowed in 1910. Now all that maybe you can say is that that person died between 1900 and 1910. The same thing with birth records. They, they didn't do it. 
And so I was acutely aware of this from early on. My father was born in May of 1912. My mother in September. He did not have a birth certificate. She did. The law changed in June. And so what happened in the 1950s, then these folks who were born between 1896 and 1912 started to need to retire or otherwise to document themselves. So there was a tremendous move to get delayed birth certificates. So what you see is a birth certificate for my father that has my mother's signature on it. So why is that? And that is in, let's see, 1955, my father took the steps to get a delayed birth certificate. He was fortunate enough that his aunt was still living and she could attest to his birth. And then what you had to do is get yourself in public records like he had to write to the Census Bureau in Manhattan, Kansas, because he understand because of the 72 year rule, then the census record wasn't public. But he had to write and get his own. And that was part of the package that had to be turned in with this affidavit from the aunt. And my mother was simply the notary public, so that's why she had signed. But that's what this is. Um, then this is a marriage record. And we are so fortunate in Virginia. And of course, again, I thought everybody was right. That Virginia marriage records give you the name of the bride and groom's parents. Oftentimes, particularly just coming out of slavery, that may be the only public record that gets you back to that earlier generation. And so this is a marriage record for my great grandparents from 1877. And it, this is the only place, and her name is Mariah Spencer, this is the only way to know her parents' name. I don't find them in any other records anywhere. Now, he says his mother is Lucy Smith. There's no father given. So maybe he, he's enslaved. Maybe he doesn't know his father's name. I don't know. But that's what he says. So then I go on and keep on. This is the death record for the same great grandfather that was getting married in 1877. Because he died in 1880 and 1917. Now, believe it or not, now we have parents. It says Father Thomas Smith, Mother Eliza, and he said Lucy. <laughs> so, you know, what is going on here? I still haven't figured that out. And but what we know is that we talk about primary sources and secondary sources. This is not a primary source for his birth or his parents' name. It's only as good as the person knows who's left behind or that they know or they can remember. So, you know, I've not figured this out, but there's that discrepancy. Then, and now these records are wonderful. Without them, we couldn't do what we do. But you have to take them with a grain of salt. This is another one. This is a death certificate for Joseph Smith, the uncle that I mentioned, who migrated north <coughs> to work with private family during the Great Migration. And he is, this is his parents whose marriage certificate you just saw. Okay, on the marriage certificate, it says that the mother's name, and it asks on bride's maiden name, her name is Mariah Spencer. And that's her name all day long in the record. But here it says Mariah Lockton. Now, it's interesting, oral history. Sometimes good, sometimes not. I've always heard that Mariah's last name was Lockwood. She was from Mascot in King and King County. But that, I mean, everybody in our family knew, knew in quotes, her name was Mariah Lockwood. So, so much so that when Uncle Joe died in 1937, the informant, who was one of his brothers, said Mariah Lockwood. When that brother died in 1955, the informant said, Mariah Lockwood, Mother Smith. When my grandmother died in 1965, you can guess what my mother said, Mariah Lockwood. I don't think she ever believed me that she was Mariah Spencer. <laughs> so my path, and this is one I've not been able to figure out, is there the good reason that they thought her name was Mariah Lockwood. They didn't just 
I don't believe this bring it out of nowhere. So it's my task to figure out was she raised by Lockwood? Did she did the family change their name coming out of slavery? I haven't figured that out because on her marriage record, she has a father named Joseph Spencer. So, you know, I've been doing this a while, but I haven't figured it all out. Military records are amazing. So, two of them, there are lots of records, but these are um, World War I. This is the draft registration. Uh, and so you had all men of a certain age had to register World War I. World War II, you even had an old man's draft that you had much older folks, 40 and 50, who had to register. So this is interesting. It allows me to see my grandfather's signature, which I've never seen before. He died in 1935. But then it says, of course, he's a widower because my grandfather has died in 1915. But he's working as a farmhand in South Jersey. I didn't know that. What I did know is that he had these two sons, my father and his brother, on the baseball picture. And then at some point, he went to school. He went to Virginia Union. He became a teacher. He became a preacher. But who knew that in the summer, he is working in South Jersey on those truck homes, possibly what he's doing. It says he's a farm man. So that's the kind of information. Newspaper articles. Now we know that black folks don't are not even in the picture now the way we should be in some ways, and we certainly weren't back then. But it doesn't mean that you can't find stuff. The article on your left is that same Thomas Smith that I mentioned, and they even called him Uncle Thomas Smith. And it, it's very paternalistic. I mean, it's just amazing how it reads. You know, it says one of the most respected colored citizens in Lower King King and talks about him being a wonderful example of his race. But anyway, but this article I found in my grandmother's Bible. And, and this, when people cut articles, don't cut the article and omit the date. <laughs> don't omit the newspaper. So I have not figured out yet where this came from. What you see is what I found in the Bible. And I don't think my mother ever saw this. This stuck in there. She would have been three or four when he died. But I think she'd have been talking about how awful and how paternalistic it was. She'd have been complaining. But I think she never saw it. Uh, the artist to the right is my great grand, double great grandmother on my father's side. And just recently, a researcher friend of mine found this article. That is her obituary from, she lived in King and Queen, but this is from the South Side Temple in Urbana, which is military camp in 1909. So there is stuff out there. Um, this is like my more recent research. One of my Canadian cousins was a coloratura soprano. No, I, well, actually, she was a contralto. And um, she had a statue in Canada that sent them to Marin Anderson to this country. So lots of information about torture. We found the town hall of AD online. And now I'll just mention these articles came from ProQuest Historic Black Newspapers, which is such a wonderful, wonderful collection. Library of Virginia has it. As a Virginia resident, you can get a library card and register online and actually access it remotely. You don't have to go into the library. The ProQuest, that collection, I think the subscription is like $60,000 a year. So it's, we just get to the point that several institutions in this state have it. But basically, it is eight or 10 black newspapers from around the country. The Cleveland Call and Post, the New York Amsterdam News, the uh, Philadelphia Courier Tribune, I can never get the names, but the black paper from Philadelphia, the black paper from Pittsburgh, um, the black paper or the Afro, and then the Journal and Guide. And so for those of you doing Virginia research, you're going to find tons of stuff. And they reported on everything. They may say that, um, in fact, we found, we're doing some research, long story on Tuskegee Airmen, but basically I learned that it's 
Christmas of 1895, this man's grandparents got married in my great uncle's house in Tappahannock. I mean, it is reporting on a wedding, and so reporting on mundane things, reporting on going to visit your sister, as well as reporting on substantial things like lynching and all, but the black press just can't be it. My question, please. Do you, do you know how far your family got to Nova Scotia? How to what? See, Nova Scotia is where she was from. Uh-huh. How did this part of your family get to Nova Scotia? Okay, real quick answer. People got to Nova Scotia, black folks, a lot of different ways. Some people went through the Revolutionary War with the British. Some people went with the British during the War of 1812. Some people went on the Underground Railroad and escaped. My great uncle, her father, did something totally different. He was an outlier. He was kind of going in his own direction. Left King and Queen County, went to Wayland Seminary in Washington, which was normal school, forgetting the normal degree, like an associate's degree. He wanted a baccalaureate degree. He was taught by a white woman in Nova Scotia who convinced him that it's much better for Negroes in Nova Scotia, where she's from, than here. So she said, if you go to Nova Scotia, I will help you get into my alma mater, because she's Canadian, and help you find some money to do so, because he didn't have any money. He took her up on it. In 1902, he graduated from Acadia, I think the third, the second black folk, black person to graduate, stayed there, married a Canadian woman, had 13 children. So that's why I have so many whites in Nova Scotia. And he actually became one of the few black officers in the British Army worldwide during World War I. He was a chaplain. And of course, it was a construction battalion that was led by white officers. But they left the black man the chaplain. Anyway, that's the story. Um, so DNA, I'm not going to get into this a lot, but it's a valuable, valuable tool. It's not a cure-all. You can't just do DNA and be done. It's something to be used in conjunction with your traditional research. And it's so important. You know, I have to say, hey, I guess we had done Y chromosome DNA, which is that from men only back in 07. About 2012, autosomal DNA, which is that that looks at your whole makeup, came out. I asked a man at a conference, I said, should I do this now, or should I wait until they get more black folk in the database? Mm -hmm. And his answer was, well, you probably need to do it now, because if more black folk don't do it, there won't be more black folk. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did it, and decided that that, I don't know how much it was at the time, maybe $150 or less, that that was my little amusement, even if it became just nothing. And it was the best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. um, so of my family, Canada, or, or my father's father's family, we probably had 80 folks to test. And it really makes a big difference. I'll run through this quickly. But test everybody. Test the earlier generation, not the oldest people, but the earlier generation. Because if I want to know about my grandfather, then I'm going to get more than my uncle's, my father's gone. But I'm going to get more than my uncle's than in mine, because I'm diluted with my mother's family. And so you want those earlier generations. What we did is we rushed to get everybody in my father and mother's generation. So um, next election will be DNA. I don't know if you find any of that. And there are lots of the major testing companies, and that's the dot com, 23andMe, my heritage. That some of the saliva sound and then I won't get too much into this, but if you have somebody that's infirm and can't spit, you can do ancestry. And of course, the University of YouTube is where you learn to do this. There's something called artificial saliva that you mix a saline solution and you swab the inside of the cheek and you can get an ancestry sensor. Uh -huh. um, so this is just, I know our time is short. This is this whole piece on cousins. And it's really necessary to know this, and this goes back to DNA, because DNA is measured in what we call centromorphs. In other words, we marry 
we measure, measure height in inches, you know, meters. We measure, so anything you do, you have a measurement. It's centimorgan. And the more centimorgan you share with somebody, the closer you are. So if you're trying to figure out your connection, there's a chart called DNA Painter. It's on the end of the camera website. That if I share, say, 862 centimorgans with somebody, I can go and look on that chart, and it will tell me what the possible relationships could be. It may tell me that it could be my second cousin once removed, or it could be my great-grandchild. And so you have different relationships that have the same amount of DNA. But if you don't know what all the moves mean, then you can't interpret them. So you got the sheet back there. Uh, this is just something to put this in proportion. As you're trying to um, figure out your family, you know, you, the number of ancestors multiply over two parents, four grandparents, eight greats, 16 double greats, 32, 64, 128, 256, 1 million and 20 generations. So we get to what is genealogically wrong. And obviously, most of that is not but it helps to put it in perspective. So, to talk quickly about getting through that 1873 book, this is when doing research on black folk who were enslaved is different because you were not listed just like your horse or your cow is not in the census, then you weren't either. And so, um, some tools. So, there are a number of things that you look at, and you're not going to find everything about everybody, but you probably find some things about somebody. So this is an estate inventory. So because we were property, if somebody died, then they, in their will, they were probably going to say, I leave my Negro girl Sue and the issue of her body to my daughter June, or I leave my Negro man Sam and so on. But you know, when you probate an estate, then what do you have to do? You have to file an inventory. You have to value. You have, just like if somebody dies, you got to pay them. They had um, a car worth $3,000. Well, they had a Negro worth $600. So this is an estate inventory. And if you're lucky, you may be able, a lot of these are only listing of black folk by person. But sometimes you can, they, they actually have last names. And then sometimes you can find family groups that you can put together. Like if I know that, um, you know, there was a Susan and an Ida and a Mariah and a Joan. If they were siblings, then I'm probably going to be able to put that together. So that's one of the sources. And of course, in our many counties, So if you can find those, wow, 
is all I can say. In some counties in Virginia, they exist for, I looked it up, Hanover County records do exist, and the cohabitation records are actually in two places. Some are at the Library of Virginia, and some are on family search. And the history of that is that this was a federal agency, but still some of them ended up at the state level. But those records that ended up at the National Archives were part of an indexing process that was National Archives, Family Search, and so on. So those are on Family Search. But the Family Search Wiki, which you should look at, tells you all kinds of things. And you go to the Family Search Wiki, which is just an informational place, and you look up cohabitation records. You go to Virginia, go to drop down menu, I kind of So if you don't enslave people 
And oftentimes, estates were more, you know, the, the people were more valuable than the real estate. So you don't want to pay taxes. So there was this form that was filed. These folks ran away. And this was Richmond County. The property they ran away from was Minokin, which was one of the research projects <coughs> I have. Minokin was the home of Francis Lightfoot Lee, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And so these Minokin was owned by this point, no longer by the Lees, but by Richard Henry Carlos. <coughs> these people ran away. So one of the first things I did was look to see whether they joined the United States Colored Troops, and they didn't. So I still haven't figured it out, but this lets us know who the enslaver was. And then Freedmen's Bill of Rights, I'm getting through this. This is an example of how you continue to find stuff. I was actually doing research for a talk that I was going to do at Stratford Hall last summer, and I went to look actually that obituary that you saw on that said Mrs. Robert Baller. I mean, that's the sexist way that they refer to women. But anyway, that's my great great grandmother. So I went to look for that, actually forgetting that it really wasn't, I couldn't find it on Ancestry, it's something the otherwise from Virginia Chronicle, which is the newspaper archive. So I just put Isabella White into Ancestry, and this shows you, and I could do a commercial for Ancestry and family search. They are adding records all the time. I mean, each of them will tell you how many thousands of records they're constantly adding. So just because you look once, doesn't say that you shouldn't look again. So all of a sudden, now I've been looking on Ancestry. I've been looking for these people for years and years. I mean, since I started on Ancestry 26 years ago. All of a sudden, this pops up. And I know it's them, Andrew White, Isabella White, Sam, Joy, James, and Milton. Joy to be my great grandfather. I mean, it's clearly the right people because it's all the same. And the children are appropriate ages. So I said, what is this? I'm seeing just a list on ancestry. I'm looking at a whole list of people. I don't know what it is because the problem with this is you, the name, you search the name and the results come up in the middle of it. And you need to see at the beginning what was it the list of in the first place? Anyway, hundreds of pages, long story short, what I learned is that they were inhabitants of a contraband camp at Mason's Island. Mason's Island is in the Potomac River between Arlington and D.C. It's now Roosevelt Island. And there was a contraband camp that the United States government contraband <coughs> camps mean those places that people were housed who had escaped from the South generally and figured out that if I can get to Union headquarters, wherever they are, then I'm safe. So there they were. I, I just found this in July. I have not figured out why on earth they were at Mason's Island. What I do know is by 1866, they were back in King and Queen to found the local church, be counted for the local church. But what was going on, I don't know. Um, books and manuscripts, uh, I hope Hennessy to do this. You may be lucky to use local books that get you back into slavery. This is a book from King and Queen County, written by an old white Baptist preacher in 1928 or whatever that was. And he has a chapter on the good Negroes of King and Queen County. But how lucky in the, about a dozen Negroes that he discusses, the first one, Osmond Bowler, is my step-grandmother's grandfather. The second one is my biological grandmother's grandfather. And it says, Tolliver Ross, so you know this is the whole white folks pronounced T-A-L-I-A-F-E-R-R-O, that we call it Tal Farrell, they call it Tolliver, and it goes back and forth in spelling. So we know him as Tal Farrell Ross. Darker color, cunning as a fox, sharp as a pro, <laughs> long in name to old Billy Brown. So that's his enslaver. And then he married a lighter girl and Colonel Pease. I suspect it's Colonel Pollard, 
because Alistair Ross' wife's name was Rachel Powell. <laughs> but you may get lucky enough to find that kind of thing. So you want to look at the history of the jail. So don't believe everything you read or hear. The story might be true, may not be true. Take it with a grain of salt. Listen to the oral history, the name game. Name spelled in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I have some cousins who people would get many people with dungeons. And those are just some of the spellings of that name. So don't even, you know, like the spell anyway. And the same thing with first names. They may fluctuate from time to time and go back and forth. Um, and as we talked about, one assumes the, that the family got the name of the slave and passed slave over. And then you want to search people around. In other words, don't forget the family. Friends and family are so different than neighbors. One of my great grandfathers, I could never find his death record. Just couldn't find him. I actually find the probate of his will, but the death record is missing. So I don't have the date for his death. And then I don't have his parents' names. But I find the death certificate for his brother and gives me parents' names. I cannot assume that they were whole brothers, but it gives me something I did not have. Um, know that the racial designation, you folks may be black one time, white another, mulatto another, I mean, all over the world. And they may actually have been designated differently, or it may be a transcription error. In other words, you see on that transcription, you see this family that the wife was black then if you think the white should have been white, then look at who you want to look at the original birth name. And documentation. And when I first started, I did not know. I mean, it just never occurred to me. It's like an academic paper. You need to keep your sources. So what they say is the genealogy without documentation is like fiction. You really, and so as a result, by not knowing you could be covered for that. I've got things that I discovered 30 years ago that I don't know how know them. And so you don't want to, in fact, I heard somebody ask an experienced genealogy, what is it that you would say to your younger self if you could go back and give your younger self some advice? And that's one of the key things to document everything. Um, now, last slide, I think. So genealogy is something best done as a group process. In other words, not alone. It, it really is a chance that you can get you a genie buddy in your family. If, if not in your family, a genie buddy can be a friend, organization. And so join local historical societies. There are all kinds of institutes and webinars. I mean, it's such a wonderful time to be doing this because there's so much instruction out there, in fact. And some of it is free. And in fact, sometimes there's so many free Zoom lectures and so much going on that you say, well, you can't do them all. Um, there's still a lot out there. The Midwest African American Genealogy Institute called Maggie is a primary teaching tool. Um, they have been virtual for the past couple of years. Before that, they uh, had their session at the Allen County Public Library in um, Indiana, which is one of the leading research libraries. Roots Tech is a conference had taken place in small places, performance, it's been virtual for the past couple of years. I gather that this tech 2023 is going to be hybrid. But if you go to Salt Lake, or you can do it online. And all of those roots tech sessions for the past couple of years are still available for lots of free instruction. And then our genealogy society, one of the things we didn't point out is back there, and I probably didn't bring one up here, I have a brochure on our local genealogy societies. We do meet virtually. Um, and that's our group down in the middle of the peninsula. The Richmond chapter of Oz, which is the Afro-American historical genealogy society, meets on the last Saturday of every month. We now have gone to hybrid. So this Saturday, we'll be meeting at the Virginia Historical Society in person, but you can also do it online. And there are other chapters in Vermont, interesting. In addition to Richmond, there's Danville, Pennsylvania County, there's Charlottesville, and there's 
can't control. And then our group said, oh, we have to kill it. It has to kill it. It was odd. But we are primarily in the middle of the end, in the north and then in the brochure back then. Facebook is a big deal. Other social media platforms. It's such a vigorous community of genealogy. So you could join a Facebook group. And I don't know whether there's Hanover, but Vince is now in the middle of the net and the daughter's neck. There are Francine and I have groups. There's something called the Daughter's Neck Reunion. There's Middlesex, Gloucester, and Matthews, African American genealogy. Then there's groups that are specific, not just geographically, but there's a group of people who are looking at how to understand ancestry DNA testing. So almost anything that you can find on Facebook group, and if there are African American specific ones, general ones, one I suggest is finding your Virginia roots, which is Library of Virginia. But, okay, get started, be intentional, don't be like I was. There was a point in the 80s when I would do a little bit of research two months before the family event, and then I would present whatever, I would touch it again until two years later. It took me probably six or eight years at least to really be intentional and curious about this. So during the local genealogy society, test everybody, do the conferences and workshops, online courses, and enjoy. And be careful because you can be addicted. I just have to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna stop and um, see if you have, how much time you have, any questions, comments, <laughs> Any idea as to which Virginia County's records were lost during the Richmond evacuation fire? During the Richmond fire. Evacuation fire. Right. I do not know that. I know that, okay, the instruction was to send your records to Richmond, mm -hmm. and then we know Richmond burned. I honestly do not know that, but the Family Search Wiki will tell you what records of what county I've had. And for instance, Middlesex County, where I live, takes great pride in saying that they ignored that instruction. <laughs> they didn't send their records to Richmond. And then a clerk of the court named Mr. Woodard decided that he was going to go and hide the records somewhere. So when the Union Army, and of course they blame everything on the Union Army, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, anyway, Middlesex has its records. Um, King and Queen does not have its records. King William does not have its records. They've been fired twice. And so I kind of know the counties I've researched, mm -hmm. but I do not know comprehensively, but if you look at the family search wiki, it will tell you what exists for each county. Any other questions? Questions, comments? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Uh, she did bring a wealth of information, and feel free to look at the binders. I think a lot of them have historical documents and obituaries and other things that you uh, talk about. Yeah. Yeah, you know, program uh, on that uncle who actually did to the exhibition, you find this kind of history in And one of the things I didn't talk about is that so important is timeline. And you find the timeline for him because if you're trying to put somebody's life together, getting the timeline helps you to keep it in order. And it, it does a lot of things, but you know, they kept using the same name over and over again. And so when you start to do a timeline, then you realize, like I'm working on a project in Richmond County, and this Daniel Gordon I'm working on, he can't be the Daniel Gordon over here, because he's not old enough, he wasn't even born when this one was doing it. So you, you want to keep a timeline. The other thing that timelines do is often a narrative is overwhelming. And so a timeline is a good way to present stuff like you're presenting to somebody who's not maybe as into this as you are, but doing that timeline kind of helps to 
see it. So you'll see one of those and then you'll just see us find it. Sada, I see your contact information up there. If anyone has any questions for me, is it okay if they reach out to you? Do you all have her contact information or email? Right, there's, there's and a, I think you have there's business, cards. business cards and brochures from my genealogy side back there. So please feel free to. And also, I think we have some little forms back there if you'd like to be on the mailing list, the email list for our genealogy society. Then fill that out and leave it, and we'll get you on the list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.